the last minute changes we had to make here to do this uh, over video conference. I tell you, we've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now, the chance to get out to Sox Center and both meet with you all in person, which, gosh, is so much better than this, as we all are understanding in this time of a global pandemic. Um, and I was really looking forward to the tour of, uh, of felling trailers as well. Uh, we will do that. Uh, there's no question. We're we're excited to come out and, and be there in person because I think that that does matter. Um, but with the weather looking like it is and a tight schedule and the need to get back in a certain window of time, we did need to pivot and wanted to pivot early enough so that we could try to put together this Zoom chat and just want to say extremely grateful that you were all able to, to make that shift. And we're all a little more used to these uh, video conferences now than maybe we were six or eight months ago, but that doesn't make them any any better than being there in person. So I just wanted to to recognize that as we start off and also just thank you all for being willing to, to be nimble and shift and and looking forward to getting out there in person really soon. Um, we are looking forward to this uh, in many ways because it's been manufacturing week and manufacturing month and because a part of our recovery as a state economy really requires government and business to work together. So really the, the goals of this conversation are, are pretty simple. One, uh, really for us to learn from all of you about the state of manufacturing, particularly in central Minnesota and obviously also in light of all that's taken place over the last six or eight months with the pandemic. Uh, and then secondly, really is just to highlight all the opportunities and uh, and the future of manufacturing in our state uh, to, uh, to those watching and to those that we speak with on a regular basis about job opportunities and growth in our economy. So lots to talk about. I'm mainly here to listen. Before we dive into kind of a, a discussion, I think it'd be helpful just to do an around the horn and hear just your name and your company, so we have a, a, the lay of the land of who's on. And then once we do that around the horn, we'll, we'll circle back and I'll kick it off with a few questions, but we can take this any direction that we like. So maybe to make this easier, I'll just read off some of the names and the, the list here from top to bottom. And when I say your name, if you could introduce yourself and your company, uh, and then we'll come back to the discussion. So I think, first of all, uh, we are joined by Allison Wagoner. Hi, I'm Allison Wagoner, and I'm with DCI in St. Cloud, Minnesota, and we make stainless steel vessels. Great. Welcome, Allison. Uh, Angie Brick. Uh, good morning, Angie Brick from Roto Chopper. We're in St. Martin, and um, we manufacture a machine called the Roto Chopper, which is used to grind and a lot for um, recycling products. Great. Welcome. Uh, we have Ben Sonic. Yes, hello, I'm Ben Sonic. I'm with Star Publications. We are going to be uh, putting together stories about this for the Sock Center Herald, for the Sock Rapids Herald, and most likely for the Star Post as well. So thank you all for uh, speaking clearly so I can write things down as fast as possible. <laughs> Great, thanks, Ben. Appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we have Brenda Jennison. Hi, Brenda Jennison. I've got my sister, Bonnie Regenovich here as well. Uh, we're sisters, co-owners, second generation owners of Felling Trailers, a trailer manufacturer located in both Stock Center and Litchfield. Great. Thanks, Brenda and Bonnie, and for being willing to host us uh, both today and hopefully in the future when we can get this yes. rescheduled to be in person. Uh, Dave Heyer. Dave Heyer is an art team indeed, actually. I should mention the deed folks we have on. We have Dave and, and then we have Jackie Buck and Adeshawa as well. You all want to give a, a quick wave and hello. And I think Della Ludwig is on too, if I recall. Good. Um, Dwayne uh, Brinkelson. Yes, I'm Dwayne Brinkelson with Park Industries in St. Cloud, Minnesota. We manufacture CNC uh, machines for fabricating products out of stone. Uh, most of our products are used to fabricate countertops. Great. Welcome, Duane. Uh, Greg Flint. Greg, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to Greg. Um, Sarah Kocher. Hopefully I'm saying your last name right. You absolutely are. Good morning. Um, I'm Sarah Kocher. I'm here with the St. Cloud Times also. I'm just listening in to, to hear a little bit more. So thanks for letting me join you this morning. Great. Welcome. Lewis Lance. 
Uh, Lance Lewis, Lewis Industries. We're a family-owned job shop, Painesville, Minnesota. We actually make parts and subcomponents for many of the other OEMs on the call today. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Lance. Uh, Larry Hosh. Hello, um, I'm Larry Hosh. I'm from the Greater St. Cloud Development Corporation. Happy to be here and see everybody. Good to see you, Larry. Uh, Lee Voss. Good morning, Lee Voss with WJON Radio. Uh, just listening in to potentially write up a news story. Great, welcome. Uh, Les Engel. Good morning, Les Engel with Engel Metallurgical. We're a metallurgical consulting firm and all these other manufacturers are our clients. And you're also the president of CMMA, is that correct? That's correct, I'm also the president of CMMA. Great, glad to have you here. Um, Leslie Dingman. Leslie, can you uh, can you hear us? Looks like she might be having a few technical issues. Um, we have Representative Paul Anderson on. Representative, can you uh, can you hear us? Uh, okay, we'll move to Tanya Adair. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tanya Adair with the Zurich, and we are manufacturer of water valves. Great, welcome. And then Tom, or sorry, Tim Zipoy. Good morning, all. My name is Tim Zipoy. I'm a business services consultant with Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Services, a partner at the Minnesota Workforce Center in Monticello, and I'm also a board member with Central Minnesota Manufacturers Association. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and I just mentioned a few other folks from DEED who are on the phone. We have uh, Della Lubbock, I think I mentioned, Jessica Miller from our team, uh, and Jen Gates as well. And I think, Sean, you're on too, right? Sean or Husky. And Commissioner, oops, excuse me, sorry, Commissioner, um, and also Representative um, or State Senator Tori Westrom is with Della in the conference room as well. Oh, great. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Senator. Thanks for joining us. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Glad you're oh, here. Good to, good to join you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that we missed in the roll call of who's on the call this morning? Great. Well, let's dive right in. You know, I, I don't need to tell this audience how important manufacturing is to our state's economy. It's $52 billion of what our state's economy produces every year. And uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do a, a roundtable in central Minnesota is that central Minnesota is really one of the engines of that economic uh, growth in that sector for our state. 15% uh, of the jobs in the region uh, come from manufacturing. Um, we are uh, in a place where you've got 41,000, almost 42,000 people in central Minnesota employed by manufacturing, payroll of over $2 billion that goes out to Minnesota workers through the businesses represented you know, on this call and throughout the region. And the average wage, of course, is much, much higher than the average wage for jobs outside of manufacturing. I think 22% higher is the numbers I most recently saw specific to central Minnesota. So. These are great jobs that you are all creating for our state, and it's a great industry that you're helping uh, uh, foster and build for Minnesota. And that's really why Central Minnesota is just a big priority for us in this tour. And part of what we're trying to do in this really unique time is, is recognize that, yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Much of the state's response is still focused on, on how we navigate that pandemic and ensure that we have the resources need to, needed to fight it and that we have the right economic levers to, to be there in the immediate term to help businesses hardest hit. Uh, but if we're only doing that and not looking ahead to the future of where our state's economy is headed, then we're we're missing uh, we're missing the whole the whole picture. And so, uh, one of the things we want to make sure we're doing is talking to manufacturers across the state because we believe so much of the future of the state's economy is dependent on a strong manufacturing sector. And we're hearing from people that the labor market is still pretty tight there; that it's harder to hire folks, um, and that growth has been a little bit more difficult. Even though you've got a lot of folks in the state who are obviously unemployed due to the pandemic. And so we're here again just to learn about some of those trend lines, how you're experiencing them in central Minnesota and your businesses. And so your stories and feedback um, and what you think state government should be doing that it's not doing is really the big purpose of, of this call. 
So I'm just going to tee up a question and we'll open the floor and uh, folks can either chime in or if you prefer to check, hit the hand raising button in the Teams function, you can do that too, but we're, we're pretty easy either way. Uh, and really, I think just the first question I'd like to tee up for the group is just as the manufacturers on this call, think about what your needs are right now. Um, you know, what are you seeing in the market? What are you seeing in the labor market right now as it relates to, to hiring and opportunities for growth in manufacturing? This is Allison from DCI in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, hiring has been a focus of ours for the last three or four years. Um, this has not made it any easier by any means. We hire a lot of skilled labor, meaning welders and high craftsmen on polishing. Um, we have been able to find people, um, but it has been more difficult and a lot of people are waiting to decide if they really want to move. Um, so it's been a more difficult time frame from just getting a, the amount of candidates we're used to getting. So you, you'd say that hiring has actually gotten harder in 2020 than before? Uh, early in 2020, we had almost zero applicants from March through probably July. Since July, it has picked up um, and we have hired six to seven people in the last 90 days, I would say. Um, we have somebody starting today. Um, we may have changed some of our expectations um, and be willing to put a little more, more training in at the, at the front end, um, but we need to be able to do that. We are a manufacturer that is known for extremely long um, careers. We have a lot of people who have worked here 30, 35, 40, 45 years, and they all think they should be able to retire. Um, and filling that gap has been really difficult. And do you say, you say that it's picked up in, since July in terms of the profile of candidates? Obviously, you're offering more with training and changing expectations, but are you, are you seeing those that apply for jobs uh, being individuals who were laid off from other industries? Or what's What's kind of the profile of the folks who you're seeing start to to raise their hands and, and look for work there? The St. Cloud Technical and Community College does have a graduating class of welders in August, so that was part of our hiring early on. Um, and I, we have hired several people who um, were laid off from other jobs. I met with a gentleman last night who'd been with us for two weeks and he had been doing traveling installations for a company for 15 years and was laid off very early on, brought back for two weeks and said, we're not sure where we're going from here and hadn't worked since. Um, so we're glad to have him. He's been an excellent addition, but it's unusual we find people with that much experience. That's interesting. What, are, what have others' experiences been like? Uh, this is Tanya from Zurich, and we're in Sartell, very similar to Allison. Um, most of our employees retire with us. We do not have very high turnover. Um, we do partner with St. Cloud Tech College um, with a dual training grant, which uh, uh, has been just a wonderful pipeline. We've gotten a lot of employees that way. Um, we've noticed we don't get as many employees as we have prior to COVID, but we're still hiring regularly. We had two employees start yesterday. Um, on our office employees, like lawyers and marketing and HR type positions, that's where we're finding we're still getting a lot of candidates, uh, but not necessarily with the manufacturing experience that we would prefer. And, and talk about that a little bit in terms of the experience you prefer. It, it, you, you mentioned partnering with the SCTC. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for degrees? Are you looking for you know years of experience in the job? What's What's required for someone to come in at the kind of entry level job there and, and succeed? For our shop employees or office employees? Let's, let's talk about the, the floor. 
Uh, for our shop employees, we do have entry level positions, um, but that's not typically where we struggle getting people. It's more like what Allison had said, the more um, the trades with the, the more skills, the welders, the machinists, um, that's where we struggle a little bit more. And that's where we've gotten some good candidates through St. Cloud Tech. Uh, but we do struggle uh, just because our business is growing and trying to keep up with that, as well as managing when are people going to retire retire and how do we how do we uh, successfully train those new employees coming in with the institutional knowledge that these employees who've worked for us 40, 50 years have. Yeah, that loyalty, both of you pointed this out, is a big component of your, your workforce. It sounds like when people people join the company, they want to stick around. What do others uh what others have to share? This is Donnie from Felling. Um I'll echo that too as far as you know, we haven't been able to hire the people. We were almost to 300 people prior to the pandemic, and we were down to in the 250s, I would say. And it wasn't because of any layoffs, um, you know, whether it was a lot of the labor market so tight, people are competing and, you know, leaving and whether they were scared of the sickness, you know, we had a few of that, but, um, you know, we're finding unskilled, it's hard to find, you know, it, we're advertising like crazy on Facebook and Instagram, and we just can't get enough candidates in the door. You know, we found I would say when that 600 unemployment was out there, you know, we were competing against unemployment. We were still competing, you know, when they still had that three or $400, whatever it was. Um, it was just, I mean, it's so difficult trying to find anybody who to work. Now on the flip side, the office, we have an opening for a scheduling coordinator. So that's doing all the scheduling on the floor. And I bet I had 40 applicants. Now, a lot of those, whether it was restaurant or, they, they didn't have the manufacturing back background that we wanted. So, um, yeah, it's just been a difficult. And then dealing with COVID, you know, our HR department's just flooded, so. Yeah, I'm sure. Bonnie, when you say that even for the unskilled workers, it's been hard to find them, and you mentioned things like the, the federal unemployment benefits and general fear about workplace safety. Are those the kinds of things that you're hearing? Because I think one of the one of the paradoxes, of course, is you currently have 230,000 Minnesotans every week claiming unemployment insurance benefits, even now at a rate that's half of their regular wages, right? Because those federal benefits are done. Yeah. More about what, what you're hearing, especially from the unskilled pool, because I think that's the, the part that's maybe the most vexing to us, if I'm honest, is why, why that isn't uh, moving more quickly. We've had people that apply. We'll offer them a position. We don't hear back from them. You know, I mean, I don't know how many times my HR gal has said she's gotten applications and she leaves them voicemails and, you know, tries following up and then they don't, you know, they don't follow through. So we've had a lot of that. And I mean, just getting candidates at all has been a struggle. So. And I think one of the, and I'm, I'm sure that you're in the same boat. One of the things that we've, we're trying to share to folks is that when we're six months into this pandemic, most workplaces have figured out the safety components, right? The PPE, yep. social distancing, like you've had a lot of time to get that right. And to the extent that folks are sort of, you know, fearful of going to workplace, which we understand, you know, you can make I don't the think argument it's safer it's at that. work. No, I don't think there's been much of that. You know, the early on there was like, that's why we lost, you know, a few early on. Because maybe they had a loved one at home with COPD or that yes. type of thing. And yep. they were just unsure. Yeah. But now yeah. we don't no. hear that. No. That's good. That's good. That That's a message people need to hear that you're almost safer at work than in any other setting. Exactly. Given how people have, have worked to. Commissioner, that. we have yeah. Greg Flint from Cold Spring that has a question. Oh, great. Hey, Greg, you're, you're back out. You're on now. That's excellent. Yeah, we'll try to see it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, we, we can. can. There we go. All right. Perfect. Thank you. I was just going to jump on and, and share or reinforce what Tanya is sharing. We don't struggle to find, I'll call it entry level positions. We've actually backed away from automation in part because we can't get the people to either maintain the equipment or run the equipment. So while the organization is prepared to do capital investments, if you can't get the people to keep the equipment running, you're better off running with labor. And so I'll call them those kind of entry level jobs. And keep in mind, we're, we pay a better wage than, let's say, for example, some of the poultry or, 
or protein businesses. So we're at, uh, we we pay a because of that we're not struggling to get kind of that entry level position. We just have a fundamental skill. And so the same way that Tanya was describing, and man, I know Park does the same thing. Um, working with the St. Cloud Tech College to just simply get more people interested in, and then going through those technical programs. You know, to run a CNC takes skills. To program a CNC takes skills. To keep it running, you know, to, to solve the technical mechanic, all those things take skills. And so, if you don't have those skills, it doesn't matter what else you might have. We have to have people with those skills. And Greg, are you um, for the for the automation at Cold Spring uh, in the CNC jobs? Are those jobs that you can? train for on the job or do you do really require sort of a, a certificate or degree coming in to be able to do that work yeah so um so the electrical tech program at at the st Cloud tech college that's the program that we rely on the most i mean literally right now aaron barker who runs that program he's teaching classes on our campus where we're pulling high school kids from a, from four schools here to create awareness to ultimately hopefully get them to go through that tech program. And so in our case, we those tech skills are necessary to run that CNC equipment. And then and it's you have to be able to program. So you have to understand software languages. You have to understand geometry. You have to understand physics. You have to understand those basic skills. And then with time, you can get good at it. And they're good paying jobs. They're, they're jobs that we'll pay people, you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year for. But we simply aren't. There's not enough people right now out there. And so we're our belief is you have to build that capacity. So we're just we can either fight with Park for the same employees, or we can try to build the capacity. And we're we've decided we need to work with the schools to try to figure out how to get more people into the system. And that that is not, that hasn't changed where we were pre prior to the pandemic. Lance, you also had a question or, or an input? You're on mute yet, Lance. Yeah, there you yeah go. I, <clears throat> technology, right? It all works <laughs> when it wants to. I, I, not only would I echo what everyone else here is saying, the, the, other, the other point that we find it more difficult too is as you move further and further away from from the metro and get further and further rural there, there's just less bodies there, there's less people out there so you know we don't have any four lanes running through painesville we're not on a freeway we're not anywhere you know near a metro area so the amount of people we can attract versus some of these other people on the call is is a smaller labor pool yeah no, those the factors on transportation play a, a big role there. And how are you, Lance? Do you have a similar experience to Greg on the automation front? Is that a component of your equation we, as well? We you know we we have to continue to invest in automation, but we have to also find the people that can that can run automation. Which you know it, it's becoming easier, but automation isn't necessarily to the level we need it to be yet. Is is we're a job shop. We don't have continuous long running you know things that we can put a robot on and let it do we we do just smaller medium sized runs um you know we've started an apprentice program with the state of minnesota we've had great success the problem is is we can take one or two kids a year where we'd like to take three or four so even even the schools out here just just don't have the bodies to support the programs we want you know we're we're looking at here under 100 people you know you get to to cold spring and in melrose and then closer to the st cloud they're they're at 200 but the manufacturers out here just need need way more bodies than 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 people so really it's how do we get the people out of the metro living in a rural area telling them their lifestyle can be better their wages are equivalent and then it's just there's less crime there's less protesting there's less violence how do we get that message that you can have a great career and live a great life in a small rural town? Yeah, no, it's an excellent point, Lance. And you know, on the automation front, one of the things we've piloted over the last year and a half is an automation training incentive program at DEED, ATIP for short, if you will. And it's something that has gone really well. And we've targeted 
manufacturers of 100 employees or less, which comprises 90% of the state's manufacturing companies. And the core idea is just Deed puts in some money to incentivize a manufacturer to, to embrace automation because what the money does is helps train workers on the machine um, more quickly and effectively through training programs that, that are proven to work and tries to, tries to combat some of the, the natural stickiness or challenges with, with adopting automation because it's obviously an important productivity move, but to the points you're making, like it does take training and take time and it's not worth it if you can't invest or find the people to do it. I think your point lands, and I'm curious if others feel similar of trying to, in many ways, I feel like trying to take advantage of the trend line right now in the, in the middle of a pandemic, highly dense urban centers are just from a health perspective than maybe, you know, parts of the state where you've got, um, you know, a little bit more room and frankly, access to a whole nother, you know, set of opportunities for recreation and what have you and, you know, different lifestyle. Are you, are you seeing any of that? I, we've begun to hear things that, you know, houses are getting snatched up a little bit more quickly in greater Minnesota than in the past. Is this a trend that you think the manufacturers can kind of capitalize on? Dwayne also had some input from Park Industry. We'll turn it yeah. over to Dwayne and then we'll have Allison after that. I was just going to echo what what uh, what Greg had mentioned earlier about uh, the students. I think uh, getting to the students at a younger age is critical too. We can get into the high schools, so we've been working more with the high schools to get them excited about a career in manufacturing. And you know, the factory isn't what it used to be uh, 50 years ago, and the opportunities in manufacturing are vast. Um, wherever you start your career uh, where you progress well there's a lot of opportunity for growth right within any company that is on this call right we have positions available so where do they want to go you can start at the ground level and grow so i think getting that message out to the high schools is, is critical uh, so that they see that as an opportunity uh, and uh, not everybody has to work in the IT world to have a successful career, right? I mean, there's great opportunities in manufacturing. Um, so I'm an example of that. I started machinist and continued to educate myself and grew throughout my entire career and just continued to move up in the company. So I like to go out and talk to the students about don't 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 be concerned about where you're starting. Uh, just get your foot in and get going and uh, continue to work hard and, and educate yourself. Um, so Park, we are we are doing a lot with automation. So we're doing a lot internally, upscaling our team. Uh, we built an internal group that is focused on automation. And part of that, that whole process includes org chart development. So if we're gonna go in and we're gonna develop a part of our factory to automate it, uh, what what does that organizational chart look like for that group? So the team that's working on it can see, hey, there's other opportunities here. Uh, we're not doing it to get rid of people. We're doing it to provide opportunities. They can see that right up front as they help develop that that work cell or that part of the process. They have an opportunity to do something new and different. Uh, and then so during that whole process, we're upscaling the team. So they're prepared to move on to whatever the, whatever the opportunities are. are. It, it's a lot of work, but uh, the, to bring in young students, I feel we need to we need to start at a younger age. So we're involved in Epic and Prime and several other things with many of the other manufacturers here at the high school level to try and keep more students moving into manufacturing. It's a choice. Really well said. I, I feel like, you know, there's a perception issue out there that I've talked to a lot of manufacturers about. And I think for several decades, you know, through the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, we A, we said all the manufacturing jobs are going abroad. So don't think about that industry. B, we said four year college or bust. And those messages uh, may be true and not true at the same time. Like there's components of that that are true and there's components of that that are absolutely false. And for any individual student, exposure to these jobs is so critical. And what manufacturers tell me is that sometimes young people think of those jobs as uh, 
hard manual labor or somehow, you know, uh, not requiring uh, great skills. And what we've already heard here is you got to know physics and electronics and a whole host of skills to be a manufacturer in the future. And to your point, Dwayne, it's these jobs are getting upskilled and up leveled to be um, something wholly different and requiring different skill sets. And they have a longer run. I mean, you, you hear the loyalty on this conversation with um, you know, Tanya and others talking about how long people stick around. So it's a, it's a, it's a great point. So let, let's talk about the, the students component and then I'd love to circle back to mid career career transitions, which I think is something we'd like to learn a little more about. Several of you have mentioned going into the schools, what, what works there and what, what doesn't, I mean, I know this year, usually I've seen during manufacturing week field trips, buses go out to shops and take a look around. Obviously without in-person school as, as broadly as possible, that, that was a little bit more challenging this year. Is that is that a, a strategy that you all continue to, to pursue in terms of just exposure and uh, awareness for, for young people? Greg, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, actually, um, I would like to advocate for VEX Robotics. Our belief is VEX Robotics. And so we, and really we partner with Park Industries extensively to get VEX Robotics into the schools and specifically start them in the elementary schools. Our belief is you have to start in the elementary schools to create awareness, get the kids interested in understanding that what they're doing can be fun, that they can, they can uh, have a good time. And then when they start to get to the middle school, they have to start making decisions about what classes to take in high school. And so go back to the to the underlying issue of science and technology and math, those sorts of things. They need to start taking those classes when they're in high school. And then ultimately what we do is we encourage those kids to start to think about after high school, what do they want to do? And so from and, that standpoint, and, and, then, and we believe we should continue on to the tech college. And so um, now we use VEX Robotics as a recruiting tool because we get access to those kids in elementary, middle, and high school, think of it as a, a three, four, five year recruiting process that helps you to understand who they are. And ultimately the fit can determine whether or not they're a good good person for your organization. So, so um, we're huge proponents of VEX Robotics. And as a result, we just think fundamentally, it's something that the, the state should get behind in a broader way. You know, I'll be honest, I had not heard of it. And I just pulled up the website as you're talking, Greg, it looks incredible. Starting at pre-K. Yeah. You know, about going to high schools and suddenly we're talking about kindergarten as a, as a time to begin. I have two four-year-olds at home. I, uh, I should get my kids on VEX Robotics. Interesting. Yeah, and the state doesn't, I don't know that we, I mean, your deed commissioner hasn't heard of it. I don't know if we as a state are invested or partnered there at all, but we'll, we'll, we're going to look into that. I appreciate you, you flagging it for us. Well, and if and Steve, if you have questions as you're looking into it, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, yeah. Technically, Vex Robotics is housed under the St. Cloud Technical Community College Foundation. So it's, it is a sort of a, a quasi state organization, but it is a nonprofit. Got it. Thanks for that plug, Greg. We'll have to look into that more. We do um, first robotics here in Sock Center on the high school level. Um, and we've been a, a very firm supporter of them since they started a robotics Sock Center four years ago. Um, a challenge, a fundraising challenge to them the last two years if they raise so much, then we'll match it um, because we just find it's very important. So I'm with you on that. I think um, if we can give those opportunities to our kids at our younger age, a lot of times by high school, you know, kids have, there's so much pressure. Everyone wants to know, what are you, what are you gonna do when you graduate? Um, and we need to start exposing them to the various opportunities much younger so they can start thinking about it at a younger age rather than suddenly they're juniors and seniors and everyone wants to know what they're going to do after high school. We haven't done a good job of showing them all of the possibilities in their own backyards. Um, so we've been really good with working with our high school. They've been great partners on showing them uh, what exists here. And so they do tours. Um, we've been trying to get them on board more with careers in the community. So we have a class at the high school level with more at younger ages, again, to just expose them that, you know, it's not just welders that we hire because so many people think that's all that work here. And, you know, as we all know, designers, engineers, scheduling, et cetera. 
Um, so just showing them all of the different technical aspects, uh, machine operators, et cetera. So um, getting to them at an early age is critical. Yeah, no question. Lance, were you gonna chime in on that point as well? No, not only not only is is the VEX robotics and the first robotics, you know, extremely important and valuable and, and gives those kids so much so much curiosity. You know, they can they can use Tinkercad online and, and draw components and, and make components and program a robot and whittle whittle steel to to make, you know, different things. Um, but beyond that, you know, we're a certified apprentice program here and we've had we've had four or five kids over the last four or five years. And you know, that program is designed to, to take the kid out of the school, put them in the facility, you know, work hand in hand with with employees at machines. And we've just had huge, huge success. I mean, all all five kids at some level, even if they're not working for us, are in the manufacturing field. You know, one one went to be on, to be a cost accountant. One one's running running um simulations here for for press breaks and, and welding and, and going to college and just you know getting the kids out of the classroom, getting them into the factory on the floor, working with adults that are that are much, much more like them. You know, not not everyone in school is gonna grow up to be a doctor, a lawyer, or accountant. And most of these kids in school are gonna gonna end up being HVAC guys, manufacturers, welders. And in showing them that, you know, it's it's a great career. The factories nowadays are well lit, very safe. Um, you know, and, and what we find is is getting them in the facility and also getting to the parents. And, you know, mom and dad can brag about you having a career in manufacturing. And it's a very good career that that, that allows you to live a very good life. Absolutely. No, there's no question. And and there's a a huge amount of opportunity for for creativity and uh, skill development. You know, we uh, my wife and I run a small nonprofit. We started about six years ago called Silicon North Stars, where we help young kids pursue careers in tech. And by far, one of the most uh, popular sessions we run is uh, with a company called Jamf here in the Twin Cities, where the students get to play with robotics and, and program a drone to do a bunch of different activities. And it's just that. We all had experiences in our own lives, right? Where you suddenly get hands-on with something, whether it's a tour or or meeting an adult who who you know has a similar journey or a similar aspiration, and and suddenly the stuff in the classroom becomes real. But unless you're out there on the factory floor, unless you're out there in businesses engaging with people who do this work, you do, yeah, you just don't have that. So I think it's it's a great point, Lance. A really good point. One of the one of the questions I have was so we're talking a lot about the pipeline and, and high school students and gosh even down to kindergarten and what sort of changed in 2020 and we, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the conversation but what's changed in 2020 of course is that you also now have a lot of uh, you know mid career folks who you know I, particularly in the service industry who are out of work now because of COVID and and that's a different type of pipeline to develop and I I wonder if if you're bullish on on that and I, and I want to just say that obviously changing careers is hard so for, for an adult it's more difficult who's maybe in an industry for some time and has found themselves out of work maybe that's some of the challenges that you're finding in, in the labor market is that that switching cost is just really high but i'm curious as you think about like has this year changed how you thought about your pipeline given the broader situation in the economy or is it still very much focused on kind of the apprenticeship youth pipeline model how are you how are you all grappling with what's changed this year and how it maybe changes where you, you focus your your recruiting and, and labor market needs this is allison again and i'll say that we not only this year but even previously have looked for people who have can fit here um with their soft skills and we can we can teach the hard skills we can teach the technical skills if we have to um, we have several entry level positions where we're willing to train from scratch um, and we have put people in there. Um, one of our best finishers, his first job was he was a drummer in a rock band in the cities and did that for 15 years and um, we trained him to be a finisher and he's done a great job. 
Um, and our customers love him because he's one of the people willing to go on field service and do repairs and stuff. So we've looked at that. I myself am a recovering attorney. So I look at career change to being a really important part of that pipeline. Um, but the gentleman that I talked about that we hired earlier, not only is he changing careers, but he's also not looking in the cities because he came from Mora and he was used to go, driving down the freeway to go to the cities to get a better paying job, according to him, and found that we have the same kind of jobs here in St. Cloud. Um, so we're looking and we're really putting ads out everywhere. Um, we have a gentleman who drives from Winthrop every day. We have several people who drive from Sox Center down here. So we're willing to put out the, the lines wherever we can get people. I still think the guy from Winthrop's a little nuts, but other than that, um, <laughs> he's a good employee. Well, if you get a drummer and a lawyer to, to make the shift, then uh, it feels like anything's possible. Anything's possible. <laughs> Della, you're an expert on workforce in the region. I see you've raised your hand. Curious, uh, your thoughts. Actually, I raised my hand for uh, the senator. He has an oh, great. But as well, and then I can add a little bit as well. Commissioner, and uh, just a comment about the COVID, and I guess I'd be interested in the uh, feedback. I think it was Greg uh, might have commented about we're having trouble finding this, the, the higher skill level, so they're focused on more entry level. Uh, with the work from home and COVID, I'm just interested and it, it crosses my mind that uh, is there is there ways to do some of the manufacturing uh, remotely, especially the higher end uh, or, or is that not possible? And what, what generates my question is talking to educators as we've uh, struggled uh, and worked through improvements in distance learning. One area that's the most difficult does seem to be that uh, the industrial tech or the hands-on uh, classes in the high schools, uh, talking to, to high school teachers around the district. Uh, but at what point does some of that automation all of a sudden make that easier? Uh, or, or are we not there yet? Uh, just, just your feedback, your experience, and uh, some, some of the struggles that our teachers and have have wrestled with is not having kids potentially in school. Uh, there are some things you just have to teach. Uh, I don't know if welding is possible uh, online, uh, but there might be some uh, of the technical aspects that that are. So just just any comments on that, I'd be interested to know, but uh, very interesting uh, discussions to, to think about. Yeah, thanks, Senator. I'll go right up to the group. Thoughts, thoughts on the Senator's question? This this is Allison again. I would say our manufacturing floor employees, we have very few that could be able to work from home. On the flip side, our drafters, our engineers, our purchasing people, um, myself, um, we have all taken rotation working from home so that we keep less people in the building and less exposure. Um, we're very um, lenient on people who want to work from home now. I mean, I think we're less than 50% of the people are here on a daily basis. Um, we did find, find from an HR perspective that our employees preferred HR to be here and not call us or text us. But beyond that, um, every other position here has our accounting positions, our IT positions, everybody has worked from home. But it's not possible for us to take a 70,000 gallon tank and ship it to somebody's house to work on. It's just not going to happen. I see a couple of their hands up. Why don't folks just chime in? It will. I can jump in. Um, so I, I'll just go to the topic of work from home, um, and then I'll, then I'll try to maybe jump back to the to the other question uh, that he had prior to that one. Work from home works if you have bandwidth. And so in our case, um, we, we at one point we had 110 people working from home and a bunch of our employees ultimately came back because simply they don't have the, the speed that enables their computer. So let's just say, for example, you've drawn something in CAD. If, if the underlying 
uh, models and things that you're pulling from are coming from a, a database in, in Cold Spring and you happen to be living in Painesville, well, there's a good chance that that technology is not going to be good enough to enable you to be effective. So with frustration, the lion's share of our drafters, our designers, even our programmers ended up coming back to, to the office. Today, I would tell you, we probably, we, while we're not restricting it, I would tell you we, we maybe have 20 people that are still working from home because there's a fundamental belief that working from the office is more efficient, more effective. Um, so that's, that's one topic. And back to, to the other question about bringing entry-level people in that are from other industries, that's part of why we're not seeing a challenge with getting those entry-level pe people. You know, what, when the re restaurant industry is struggling, we find there's more applicants that have a desire to want to learn more and, and understand what we do. And then we do take the, the view that if we hire for soft skills and then we'll develop the rest. And so to the extent that they have those skills that we're looking for, the soft skills that, they're, that we're looking for, it doesn't matter if you're 50 or if you're you know, 25, we will bring you in and we will invest in you to help make you a longer term employee. And like some of the other organizations, you know, right here in central Minnesota, we have about 700 people. Uh, 300 of them have 25 years of experience. So once people are with us, they typically don't leave. So hire for soft skills and train for the rest. I've heard that a couple of times, I feel like, on the call. Yeah. You know, I'm curious uh, for, for others, I mean, as you think about what the state can do more, you've mentioned VEX Robotics, other programs that are out there that we could support further. What would you like to see from, from DEED? Uh, or from Dolly or from other state agencies who focus on manufacturing. And we've got programs, I'm sure you're aware of them. We can talk about those, but I'm curious, what are we what are we not doing that we should be doing? Well, Steve, I'll jump in. I apologize if I'm monopolizing, but I'll just jump in and share. So, and again, I'm you may not be aware. So right now we're partnering with Ricori, Kimball, Eden Mallee, Watkins, and Painesville to host kids on our, our campus. The superintendents of those schools had to circumvent red tape to enable it to happen. Now, I don't know what it is that they have to, to jump around, but the, the gist of it is the school systems make it difficult for the schools to collaborate with us. And it creates frustrations. And in some cases, some superintendents would rather not even deal with it. So while there's a general desire, or they're not even go as far as to say they're hungry for collaboration, the regulatory environment makes it difficult for the schools and maybe we're naive to the restrictions and so I, I, anything that could be done to help get their message told as to this is why we can't do what you know for example in construction part of what we do is construction we can't have kids involved regulations prohibiting it and so from that standpoint i'm not exactly sure what how the schools are getting their message told Got it. Andrew, we haven't heard heard from you yet. I'm curious if you have some thoughts on on this topic of what the state could do to to do better here. I think that the other thing we've heard obviously is the is the five G component, as Brenda mentions in the chat, and we've talked about already that broadband is such a critical component of all of this. Um, Angie, thoughts that you might have? So I was just going to maybe hit on that piece as I'm struggling with my computer right now. It seems like I'm having some technical problems, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, like for us working from home was there were the folks who live in like St. Cloud area were fine, but those who live in um, rural St. Stearns County, that was hard um, and definitely our drafters and engineers could not work from home because it just did not work for them to be able to do that. So we like mimic everyone else, um, unless if those folks live in an area where their um, where their internet is stronger or they just they have the capabilities of doing it. Um, and as far as like program, um, I do agree with Greg that having that breaking down those barriers basically of just being able to 
how the schools and the um, companies work closer and like the program that they're doing at in Cold Spring, um, I think is going to bring some really unique opportunities to all of those students. So I'm excited for those kids and just the opportunities that they'll be able to have. So just seeing more of that would be great. We're also involved with like the Western CEO program. It's just a little bit different program, but I know that um, Felling Trailer is also involved with that. Um, I know COVID has decreased, you know, their ability to go out and um, see different factories and get tours, but that's also a very unique opportunity for students um, to be able to learn just another facet of, oh, I apologize, um, another facet of the world and being able to go out there and work after they're done with school. Have folks tried virtual tours? Is that, speaking of connectivity, you'd need that. Is that worth a shot or not really? Not really the same, is it? Yeah. It's, it's hard to see the detail on a virtual tour and um, the interaction of the questions and answers isn't quite as easy. Um, so we have we've done one with a, a high school here uh, with only two students participating and the students ended up when we started opening up just a bit more coming in so that they could see it in more detail. They didn't find the virtual side to be nearly as helpful. Yeah. You know, Les or Tim, if you have some things to share about what CMMA is doing, but I'm I'm curious. I know it's, it's a really unique collaboration you've built there in central Minnesota. And what what can we learn from that? And, and how can we partner better at DEED? Hi, this was Les. And uh, I think we've done a lot of good things. Everything you've heard from all these folks who I think are all members of CMMA and have been involved in various kinds of ways. But... <clears throat> The big thing, of course, has been workforce development. And so some of the things that CMA has been involved in, one is to work with the companies and the schools about the youth apprenticeship programs. There's two programs, one that's run by the Department of Education, another one that's run by the Department of Labor. And so we'll go out, <coughs> our members will go, and we, in the beginning, we actually would visit with a school, bring in the manufacturer and get them all to understand how to work together. <clears throat> that was the big thing. So we've been doing all that. And, and the other part is to realize that the tour manufacturing that is going on all over the state was actually invented in 2009 by CMMA, <clears throat> which I thought has been interesting that it went so well that it went statewide. So I thought that was good. The two big things we got going right now is if you look at the CMMA site, we just uploaded a whole system on youth apprenticeship. And so that can be, it can be schools, it can be businesses. They can go in and it gives you all the information you need for both of those programs for youth apprenticeship programs. And there is one that Greg mentioned, which is, is a bigger stumbling block, is the one about construction. And, and I know there's a group of people trying to get that straightened out, but it's, it's an intriguing problem of kids working in construction. But that's the one. And the next one that we've got that's about to go live is a website application where students and parents and teachers can all go onto that site, find the businesses, and the businesses have preloaded into the site one who they are, what they do, their websites and videos, whatever they want to put in there. And then in the site, they've also put in what they're willing to do to help the school. And there's, I think it's about hmm. six or eight choices in there. You can, uh, you're can, you interested in having an apprenticeship. You're interested in doing tours for students, uh, you know, uh, mentors, giving talks in classrooms. So the manufacturer has gone in, loaded in what they're willing to do, and there's a direct contact. And we learned that from the teachers, is that we found out that teachers have students and they want to go on a tour. So they yeah. just cold call a company and the company says, oh, we don't do tours, come on. Well, this teacher does that three times and then there isn't any tour. That's the end of that. They don't have time for that game. And so the idea here was to shortcut that, that when you go in there and look, you're gonna see a contact person's name. You're gonna know that this company has agreed 
to provide these various kinds of support. And so that one is uh, just about to get going here, hopefully in another month or so. And That's I, great. And I should mention, you talk about support, that those programs, we were financially supported by the Initiative Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So support they those. So I think there's every, all the stories you've heard from everybody. This has been the universal messages I've heard from every manufacturer for, I don't know, probably the past five years. And it's just, and the pandemic didn't help. <laughs> yeah, no, no question. Thanks for that, Les. I think we'd love to help promote that site. We'll look for a link after this and, and send it around. It sounds like a great resource. I should mention, we want to give the journalists on the call a chance to ask questions of any of the panelists uh, or myself, if, if you'd like, in a moment. But I wanted to put a plug in that based on conversations like this and with other manufacturers across the state, we're going to uh, launch really a communications campaign on, I think, Thursday called Good Jobs Now. Really simple, but just pointing out that there are a lot of good jobs now in Minnesota and we're really leaning into manufacturing as a sector that we want to highlight. And so um, really it's a simple concept, but what we're asking for is any manufacturer who wants to, to submit a video, just talking for whatever, minute, less, however long it takes so to say, you know, here's, the, here's what we're hiring for. Here's why it's an important role. Here's what it means for the future of your career. And here's how to find out more. And we're going to publish, you know, a pretty simple interactive map with those videos on it where people across the state can go and look for where the jobs are and kind of hear it in your own voice of, of why as you consider um, jobs at your firm. And so we'll circulate after this roundtable a link to how you can submit a video there, but it's it's pretty simple. Uh, it's just a video that, that talks about what you're, you're building and then we're gonna promote it. Uh, the governor, myself, others in, in government, just to say, you know, uh, while we know that the news more broadly in the economy is challenging, there are good jobs now in our, in our state. And so um, this conversation and others like it have just made that really clear to us and it's something that we wanna, wanna highlight. So more to come on that. Um, but I'll pause now, and I know we were fortunate to have the journalists come and, and share some of this. Speaking of communications and just getting the word out on uh, your businesses, I um, want to open the floor for any of the media who are on if you have questions for the group. Hi, this is Sarah Kocher with the St. Cloud Times. Um, I want the um, we've talked on the pandemic some of the challenges specifically related to working from home. Um, I know that you all are also focused on um, kind of the future and um, making sure that you keep people at your companies. I want to hear um, if you see any challenges that have been posed to you by the pandemic that you um, that you see affecting you a little bit more long term. Does that make sense? Good question. <clears throat> Sarah Lance here, Lewis Industries. One of the challenges that we we see we weren't prepared for with the pandemic was the whole schools closing and opening and, and closing and opening and going online virtually and, and so on and so forth. You know, some of our, our working people here, whether it's office or plant that have children, whether they're a single family or a, or a married couple, just, you know, navigating that uncertainty on a daily basis has been very difficult, number one for them, but number two for us. You know, there's there's mornings when, when people are calling in saying, I can't come to work today because I have to deal with my kids. And then there's just no option for for what to do with those kids. So that's that's been one of the challenges that, that you know, we fight on a daily and a weekly basis. And we're going to continue to fight that, you know, for, for who knows how long. And when we're reliant on a schedule and people to, to staff lines and machines and all of a sudden those people are unavailable but want to come to work, it it poses an additional challenge. Ben, do you have a question too? Yes, I do. And basically, uh, this is this is kind of a multi-part question. Uh, first of all, as far as the pandemic goes, uh, how has that affected like manufacturing supply? Because I'm well, I'll take for example in the construction industry, lumber really short supply right now. Prices can vary day by day. So like. Uh, how has that been affected? Like, how like has this affected? Well, not the lumber supply, but has supply affected manufacturing to a significant significant degree? And if so, has this also affected like the hiring side? Like, how many people you would need? 
I, I'll start with that, Brenda Jennison, Filing Trailers. Um, so yes, our suppliers, it has definitely, the pandemic has affected getting our supplies when needed. Um, a large part of that was early on when, um, you know, being upon the part of the country where the pandemic was really hit hard, they didn't have staff to fulfill orders. And so there were large delays in getting um, what we needed. And thankfully we were able to have um, some extra stock inventory on hand and, and we strategized to, to plan for those things. But um, it's that was just one example of Axel. There's other components as well that um, we're waiting on because of how the pandemic is affecting our various suppliers and in, in industries. As far as hiring, we are still hiring. We've been hiring for five, six solid years. So that has not changed at all. Um, Maybe one more uh, one more question from the friends from the press. Lee, is that your hand up? Yeah, Lee. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so as I sit here and, and listen to you folks, the, the general theme appears to be recruiting issues and getting in front of younger kids, um, getting apprenticeship programs started. In, in talking with Gail Cruikshank from the GSDC over the years, uh, that there is this perception that manufacturing is dark, dirty, and dangerous. And I've heard a few comments that it's it's not that anymore. But I guess my question is, is that the biggest challenge, trying to get over those perceptions when, when getting in front of these kids? This is Allison, and I'll take that. Um, I think it is an issue that we've had to deal with. And it's not only with the kids, it's with their and a couple of other people talk about getting to the parents also. So when we do tours or if we do um, career fairs, we have um, materials for the parents too, so that the parents understand that these are good careers, long-term careers. Um, they can, you know, take care of themselves. They can remain in the community, um, all of those things. And it's really getting to the parents, not only the kids, but the but their folks to understand that these are good careers for their for their kids, um, and that's that's a huge hurdle around here. Um, there's a lot of that. You've got to go to real college versus the tech schools or whatever. And um, I find that when I go out to meet friends, I find it when I meet with these parents. Um, when we've done tours, I've taken parents aside and just dealt with the parents, especially when you see that a kid is really interested. Um, so we take those and we show them how that they can take their high school geometry class or their introductory to algebra, and this is how they apply it in a manufacturing si situation. Those skills are necessary here. Yeah. yeah. Let me add to that, if I can. Um, and, and, I, and to do this, I'll, I need to tell a quick story. So my kids went through the Recori school system. And in addition to dealing with the parents, you have to get the school system to ultimately understand that these aren't bad jobs. My kids used to come home and I can remember my daughter saying, dad, they did it again. They said, if you don't do a good job, you're gonna end up at the sheds. Well, the sheds is a derogatory term referring to our company, at which point it was time for us to engage with the school. And, and I say, I'll say, set the record straight. So we went through a process then of sitting down with the principals and the counselors and explaining who we are. What I recall, and this is about eight years ago, the principal at that time looked over and his wife was a curriculum director. So the principal and the curriculum director in a meeting with us, he looked over and said, man, did we mess up. At the time, I thought he was talking about his job. Turns out he was talking about his son. His son had just graduated from UN, University of North Dakota with a political science degree and was delivering pizzas. Since that day, the school has gone almost 180 degrees. Every school member, whether you're in the whether you're the cook, whether you're the you know the counselor, uh, this last even during the pandemic, we had roughly speaking 20 new teachers, administrators, and so on who came through the company to understand who we are, what we do and why kids graduating from Macquarie shouldn't be afraid of coming to work for us. So I would, I would agree, the, one of the biggest challenges we have is not the children. Mm -hmm. it's, it's their parents, it's their schools, it's anybody that can give them advice. And when they get turned off, how would they know any different? So 
that gets back to that issue of we have to tell the story on why we're a good place to go if you want a good career. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, I, and yes. I'm going to piggyback off of him again and say um, from those types of conversations, the technical college here did a wonderful event about two years ago and brought in the principals, the counselors, and had them look at all of the different programs that the tech college had. Um, I want to say in a half day, they saw 10 to 15 programs. It was an amazing event that made them realize that, you know, tech college is more than just welding. It's more than some of those types of skills. And you need to understand that you have students who are begging for these opportunities. And part of how that happened is the gentleman that Greg mentioned earlier, Aaron Barker, his daughter was advised not to consider the tech college because she was better than that. And I believe Aaron hit the roof. But um, you know, we've got to look at all these opportunities of combining all of this creativity for these kids. They can use it in so many different ways that kids just don't understand. I went to a career fair at South Junior High last year and one of the girls fairly sarcastically said, I love to write. What am I going to do in a manufacturing situation? And they said, you're going to work in marketing. You're going to convince other people that they can come to our facility and they're going to get what they want. Oh, I never thought of that. You know, you've got to make it clear mm -hmm. that there are careers in all of these areas for these people. Yeah, no, that's really well said, Alice. And I, I know we're a little over time, but it's uh, these are great stories and anecdotes that I think really make the point we've been making all along here, which is that there are so many opportunities in these fields and we just need to elevate them more and, and get more exposure to them and, and do a little perception changing on these industries and, and the opportunities there. So this is this is part of that journey. And I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, Brenda and Bonnie, thanks for being willing to host. We will come out soon. We're very grateful for that. And Senator Westrom and Representative Anderson, very grateful that you've joined us uh, today, too. And thank you for your leadership on this issue and something critical. Um, we need to do better in state government on this front, uh, and that's why we're engaging these conversations. We're here to learn and, and get more information. I've taken copious notes here. I know our team has, too, and we're going to take them back and discuss them with the cabinet and others as we look at this next chapter of our economy. So um, thanks for joining us. Again, we are launching this Good Jobs campaign on uh, on Thursday in the chat of this uh, of this uh, meeting, you'll see from Jen, comms director, her email and phone number. Uh, cut and paste that if you can, or we'll send it around an email afterwards. But if you have a video to submit or want to participate in the the campaign, we'd love to love to highlight your firms and where you're hiring and and keep the conversation going. So I think uh, with that, we'll wrap on behalf of all of us at Deed. Thanks again for taking the time, and looking forward to seeing you in person next time, uh, real soon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>